are you ready to persevere through your challenges? Let's do this. I want to introduce you to my friend, Whitney. Whitney, welcome to the Perseverance Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. When you were five years old, what was life like for you? Beautiful, wonderful. I was really blessed to be given to a high school sweetheart couple who had been together since they were 15 years old. They had the quote unquote storybook fairy tale. They went to high school together. They went to college, got married. And I was their beautiful bundle of joy. I was always the center of attention with a bunch of adults. I was used to getting up on stage with my dad. He's a drummer and I would go sit with the band and be on stage. And my mom comes from a theater background. So put me in dance classes and theater classes. And so it was beautiful life as a five-year-old. My mom was a believer and my dad was not. Now my father knew of the Lord, but he would tell you today that he thought that he was going to ride into heaven on my mother's coattail. She told him often, that's not the way it works. She was always a really solid marker, direction pointer to Christ as a child for me. And when I was seven years old, I was at my uncle's church. My uncle was a pastor and they had an altar call. And I realized in my seven-year-old brain, I've never done this before. I've never actually walked down an aisle and accepted Christ. And so I did. And I remembered the elders of the church surrounding those of us who had walked down the aisle and they laid hands on us. And this was a spirit-filled church. So they started speaking in tongues over us. And I'd never, ever heard that before. I was raised in a Presbyterian church. So I hear these people saying this stuff I've never heard. And I remember that night going to bed and my uncle and aunt came in the room and they said, do you realize what you did today? And I was like, I absolutely do. I want Jesus to live in my heart. I want to be with him forever. That was my childhood. It was great. My dad ended up getting saved when I was nine. So I was raised by two amazing Jesus-loving parents. You were the center of attention and you loved it. Oh, yeah. And that was something that you craved into teenage years. It's always been a part of me. Unfortunately, as a teenager, that was my love tank. That was the way that I was receiving affirmation and receiving acknowledgement that I was worthy or important or valuable. How much are people paying attention to me? Is what I'm doing enough? And that made me want to roll with the popular crowd of my school. And I did. I'm a very A-type driven person. So if I want something, I go after it hard. And so I wanted to be a cheerleader. I got on that cheerleading squad. I wanted to have the star role of all of the plays in our local community theater. I got those roles. I know that those are also gifts from the Lord. The Lord was blessing me in that time, but my drive was that admiration and Mm -hmm. achievement and recognition. As I was rolling with the popular crowd, I started to go and party with them. And I wasn't doing anything that was so off course. I was just drinking, but I was saved at seven years old. I grew up in a Christian home. I knew better than that. I knew better and I purposefully separated from my youth group and chose to go in this other direction. As I stepped away from that youth group, the adult leaders didn't pursue me. They didn't come after me and say, hey, come back. So to me, it it was a validation that I wasn't really that important to them anyways, which is a lie, but that's what I thought. And this other group of people were giving me attention and it made me feel special and made me feel wanted. And so that's what I did. And then, of course, naturally, those relationships are built on crumbling sand. They're not valuable at all. And so as I'm leaving high school and going to college, all those people who I thought were my best friends turn their backs on me. I'm going to Clemson 
and I'm going to start fresh and I'm going to rule this campus. In the South, rush is a huge thing. And so at Clemson, you rush the very first week you're at school. And there were 12 sororities at our school, but in my hometown, you only joined one of three. Okay, it was like, these were the top tier, top sororities. So in my head, I'm thinking, I have to get one of those sororities, I have to. So I go through the rush process and every single day I get cut by more and more of these top three sororities until I finally get to the end of the week where there's only two groups. One of them was one of the top three and the other one was Zeta Tau Alpha, ZTA. And I go to these parties. One of the girls who's rushing me is from my high school in the top three sorority. She's, she's a year older than me and she's like, listen, you're getting a bid from us tomorrow. You don't have to worry, we got you. So I go to the Zeta prep round and they are loving me and so welcoming in my head. I'm not going to join your sorority, so thanks for having me, but I've already picked this other one. The next day I get the invitation and it's a Zeta invitation, not the other sorority that promised me a bid. The only way that could have happened is if people voted against me and they did. So then there's this other like very first week of school and I'm just rejected one more time. And it's from people from high school. It was so painful. And at 18, your brain isn't even completely developed yet. So you don't have the emotional knowledge to be able to figure this out logically. So what do I do? Obviously join Zeta and rush headlong into finding a boyfriend. So I start dating this guy not a believer in a fraternity we're partying like college kids party I have my bible on my bedside table for years just don't pick it up and I know in my heart that I'm not doing the right thing I know that this is empty I remember one morning it was before a football game and I woke up and one of my friends put a shot of vodka in front of me It's like 8 a.m. And she hands me the shot and she's like, take the shot. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. And she's like, yeah, but it's game day. Let's go. And I remember thinking back to being at home and the safety of being at home and the comfort of that. And then here I am in this college town. I'm being handed a shot of vodka at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, this is insane. This is not who I am. I don't like this. But... I didn't know where to find another group of friends. I didn't know how to remove myself from the sorority. So Mrs. A type achiever, I'm going to be the vice president of the sorority. That's going to make me feel good. I'm going to get this full ride to Clemson. I get the full ride to Clemson. I get these internships over the summer. I'm in these relationships with these guys. I look like I have it all, but inside I'm like miserable. How did you get to the light? I was coming back to school for my junior year. I'm 20 years old, and I was in a relationship with a Catholic guy who was not a believer. He was a Catholic by family, and my misery level is rising. Now on the outside, I look like everything is perfect, but it didn't feel good. And I say to the guy, I think we need to go back to church. And he goes, let's go to the Catholic church. And I said, no, we can't go to the Catholic church. We've got to go to a Bible teaching church. I don't know anything about Catholicism. And he's like, well, I'm not coming with you. So I realize that our relationship is on shaky ground because I'm 20. I want to get married. I'm hoping that I find my husband in college. I don't want to have to go through my 20s single. I grew up in a home where my mom and dad had a healthy marriage. So I knew that if I stayed with him, the foundation of our relationship was not going to be based on Christ because we couldn't even come to an agreement with where we were going to go to church. Even though I was in my rebellion, even though I was in my sin, I knew I had to walk away. So we broke up and it was dramatic. I decided to go home for the weekend to see my mom and dad because I didn't have anywhere else to go where I felt like I was going to be safe. And I 
was weeping and begging them, please, please let me come home. Please let me transfer home. Let me go to the school that's in my hometown. And my mom and dad, dad, you are not coming home. You have been given a full scholarship to Clemson. You are in these organizations. You're in leadership. Your world there is thriving, but you are the one who's empty. You are the one who is choosing this and letting yourself live empty. Before I got in the car to drive back to Clemson, my mom grabbed me and she said, Whitney, I will always point you back to the Lord. You will not be happy anywhere until you get your life right with the Lord and turn back to Him and you know it. So I get in the car and I've got this four-hour car ride back and I start screaming at God. How could you let my life get to this point? How could you let me go through all that pain I went through in high school and all this pain that I've gone through at Clemson? And, And here I am again, I'm 20 years old and I'm miserable. How could you let me do this? How could you get me to this point? I'm telling the Lord, how could you get me to this point when it was me the whole time? And the Lord is so long suffering and so patient and he's just letting me vent and vent and vent. And I remember driving back, I got 30 minutes away from school and there was just this peace in the car. I finally was done ranting and I knew that I was done with doing things my way. I knew that there was no other option but to turn back to the Lord and come home. I went back to my apartment and laid down on my bed and looked over at my bedside table and there was that Bible that was sitting there. Literally had dust on top of it. No lie. I open it up and I start reading and I remember just saying out loud, Jesus, if you will take me back, I'm ready. And I woke up the next morning and It was literally like these scales had been taken off of my eyes. I saw crystal clear vision of where I was and what I'd been gifted. And I had hope again. There was a football game that day. I didn't go to the game. I decided to drive to a nearby town by myself and just go spend some time walking around and doing a little shopping and just processing what had just happened. That day, I was getting ready to MC the Clemson homecoming pageant. And so I'm getting ready to do this first stage event in my new adult salvation moment. It wasn't until that day when I was 20 that my faith became my faith. And so I knew that I had to make some really hard choices as a... (laughs) new adult follower of Christ to put boundaries around my life to be able to ensure that my fledgling faith with him would be safe. So that meant that I needed to stop going to parties, which meant that I had to stop hanging out with the friends I was hanging out with. I needed to get back into church because I needed a community of believers to surround me. And I needed to start having a quiet time every day, which meant reading the Bible and journaling. And as I took those steps, he blessed me and met me in those places. My friends did not understand it. They were angry. They were hurt. It was painful. I'm not friends with a lot of those people anymore. I didn't know where to go to church because I was in Clemson. And so I started coming home on the weekends because I knew I could go to my home church. As I started doing that, I met a guy named Chris. My dad, the drummer, has made friends with a local radio station founder who's four years older than me, whose name was Chris Mead. My dad has invited Chris to come to our church to play bass guitar in our church worship band. I see this guy with this bass guitar and these Chuck Taylor shoes with this shaggy brown hair and glasses. I'm thinking to myself, there is no way that he would ever give the Clemson sorority girl a second glance. So we start hanging out when I come home on the weekends. We first start going out to lunch with my mom and dad after church. Then he starts inviting me over to the radio stations. In the meantime, my mom is like telling him, Whitney's a communications major. She would love to volunteer at the station. She's telling me, 
Chris owns a radio station and he really wants you to volunteer. She was matchmaking and it worked. (laughs) As time went on, Chris didn't want to mess up his friendship with my dad. And he was really concerned that if we started dating and then we broke up, that it would just blow up his friendship with my parents. And my parents were at that time supporting him and his ministry with the radio station. And so he didn't want to lose that friendship. And so I did what I do and invited him to come to a sorority formal with me. We were the only sober people in the room, but it was a great night and we got engaged. And then we were married two weeks after I graduated from Clemson the next year. The moment I turned back to him, the Lord had this amazing gift in Chris just waiting for me. I tell people all the time, salvation is only the beginning of the journey. It's never the end destination. It's a lifelong marathon with the Lord. I married a very Christ-fearing, God-honoring man, and so he has led us in our 14 years of marriage. I wanted to be a news anchor. That's what I went to school for. I graduated and I couldn't find a job. And so with Chris doing the radio station, it is a nonprofit station. And I knew that me getting a job at this news station where I would have to show up at three o'clock every morning would be a very heavy life for us. I wanted a normal life. I wanted an eight, eight to five kind of job. So I got into IT, that was the first thing I did, and then ended up transitioning into a marketing position where I did healthcare marketing for a large hospital system. And I loved working for the hospital. In the meantime, we're growing the radio station. And because it's nonprofit, we weren't raising enough money for Chris to be able to bring home a full paycheck. So he started doing video production on the side just to make extra money. Well, the Lord blessed it so much, that became our bread and butter. And at 25, we decided to try for our first baby. So literally within two months, we were pregnant with our first daughter. And that was such a gift. I had a completely healthy pregnancy, beautiful baby, but I decided not to go back to work because I didn't want to leave her all day long. I wanted to to be a stay-at-home mom. I did that for two years and then we decided to try for another baby. And in the meantime, our video production has grown, our radio station has grown. Life is rosy and happy and perfect. So we have our second baby and right before we had her, a pipe burst in our house, flooded our whole first floor. So we had to move in with my mom and dad for eight weeks. I'm eight months pregnant, dealing with this pipe burst. Then we get an email from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. You have been granted a construction permit for 92.5 FM. This whole time we've been a streaming station, we get a construction permit to build the tower and turn on the air. And then we have our baby. So I'm this new 28 year old mom with a three year old, a newborn baby, I've just redid my whole first floor because of the flooded pipe. My husband is is turning on the radio station for the first time while he's running video company. And I also at that point had taken on a leadership position in a large women's Bible study. So I'm teaching the Bible to 300 women every week. And Satan's like, let's sprinkle on some postpartum depression on top. I've never been depressed or anxious or anything. And here I am having panic attacks on my bathroom floor. And I realized that thankfully I had a a mentor in my life who said, you have got to go to a counselor. So I go to this counselor and she says, you need therapy twice a week and you need to get on medication. So I get on the medication, I start going to therapy and she just starts unpacking all this stuff with me about my performance mentality and why I had craved being the center of attention and how gifted God has made me. But at the same time, I was valuing myself for what I did, not who I am. 
So that was what happened with early motherhood and early marriage. The one thing I want you to remember, becoming a Christian doesn't mean it's perfect. And Whitney is going to share another part of her story. We decided to move uh, about two hours south of where we lived to Charleston, South Carolina, where my husband grew up. We moved down to open a second office of our video production company because it had become so successful. So we moved down to Charleston. We get our second office up and running. And my dad wins this huge national award. And we all go on vacation to go celebrate his big award. And we come home from vacation. And I'm like tired, extremely tired. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what was wrong. So I go to my doctor and he goes, you're fine. You're a young mom. You guys have a million things going on. Don't worry about it. So over three months, I gained 30 pounds. This is insane. Hypothyroidism runs in my family. So I call my dad and I'm like, hey dad, all of these symptoms that I'm experiencing right now, plus the weight gain, fatigue, all this crazy stuff, does this sound like hypothyroidism to you? And he's like, it sure does. He's like, instead of going to your doctor again, why don't you come to my doctor, who's a holistic physician? So I make an appointment with him and I go see him and they do this huge blood panel on me and I get the results back. And he's like, hey, you're hypothyroid, but you also have Lyme disease, Lyme disease. And he said the stress of the past year triggered the Lyme. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you do for Lyme disease? He said, we're going to have to treat you with antibiotics hard for two years. And I really don't want to have to tell you this, but you're going to have to go part-time with work because you're going to be so tired. The die-off of the virus in your system is going to be so bad that you are going to have to sleep every afternoon. You're going to have to change your diet. You're going to have to take 30 plus pills a day. And I'm like, okay, if you say so. I was handling the marketing side of our video company. I had to call all my clients and tell my clients that I was going part-time and one by one they start firing us. So we're losing clients, we're losing money and I start taking this treatment and he was not joking. As this stuff dies off in your system, it toxifies your system and so you have to detox from the Lyme die off and they're called spiricates. They are these little corkscrew shaped bacteria. And as they die off, you have to flush it from your body. And I did that for two years, two years. I could not take a shower without having to go lay down after I took a shower. That's how tired I was. I couldn't exercise. I looked swollen. It was low. It was a low season, especially being an entrepreneur. We lost half of our revenue in a three-month time frame because all these people fired us because I had to scale back work. It was crazy. And we have these two little girls. <laughs> and I have to be a mom. So my performance mentality, here I am having to take naps in the afternoon, I felt wretched. Wretched. It was awful. So then how did God come to your rescue? Well, first off, he came to my rescue because he crafted the diagnosis. He brought me to the right person so that they could find out what was wrong with me. I'm deep in my relationship with the Lord at that point in my life. I'm talking to the Lord all day long. So he's constantly comforting me. But he starts giving me these ideas as I'm resting and recovering. And he's like, hey, remember when I made you a Bible teacher when you were 25? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> And he's like, so all the stuff you've been doing for all these other women in ministry, like social media management and getting their online courses up and running and giving them all this vision for their future of their ministry, why can't you do that? And I'm like, Lord, you want me to teach the Bible on the internet? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I see this opportunity where there's very few women teaching the word on YouTube for other women. And I feel like 100% imposter syndrome. 
somebody's going to call me and tell me that I didn't get permission to start this channel and the only reason I'm doing it is because I have a video production company and I've got the resources. Somebody's going to call me and be like, you didn't go to seminary, you don't know enough. I'm like panicked over what people are going to say in the comments. I'm like freaking out. So I launched my first video and it's how to have a quiet time. I was so nervous filming this video that I literally had red hives all the way up my neck. You can see it on the video. I'm wearing this huge scarf to try to cover it up because I was so nervous. Like you have to realize I don't get nervous on stage, but doing this YouTube channel, I was so scared. And I'm trying these other videos, makeup videos or do some fashion videos, thinking that I could be one of those types of YouTubers. I did some vlogs, like day in the life vlogs. My audience wanted Bible content. They wanted me to teach the Bible. They didn't want to watch vlog videos. They didn't want to watch makeup videos. They wanted Bible content. And so that's what I started to create. And all of a sudden it started to take off and I've got 500 subscribers and I've got a thousand subscribers and then I've got 10,000 subscribers. And I'm like, what is going on here? So we start throwing more resources at it as a company. We start filming more and I'm starting to get more confident in it. Why don't I start praying for people on YouTube? So I start these prayers and I write these prayers in my quiet time. So they're very like, saturated in the Holy Spirit. My channel is about to hit 60,000 subscribers, which is really, really exciting. Really exciting. You can find me at WhitneyMead.com. That's kind of my headquarters. It's where everything lives. You can also find my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Whitney Mead. And that's M-E-A-D-E. -E. You can also find me on Instagram. And I also have a podcast called The Mead Feed. The Perseverance Podcast is all about people's stories that have persevered. And your story is exactly that. 